And it's out of that frustration that I started reading the Bible. And I stumbled on Jesus. I really say I wasn't looking for him. I stumbled on him. You know this passage where Paul writes, for me living is Christ and dying will be again. That's in Philippians uh, chapter 1 verse 21. That's the verse that changed my life. I was saying, but this man knows what he lives for. What do I live for? What is the meaning of my life? I need to find out what I live for. So I gave myself six months to read the Bible through three times. So I committed my life to the Lord, and I started preaching. But I was a preacher full of anger and hatred. And that bounced my anger back to me. And God told me, you hate those people. I said, I do. I hate them. Do you know what they did to us? And you see what they are doing to him. And that sparked a journey into change. It was actually what changed my life was the prayer Jesus made when he was on the cross. When he's hanging there with a crown of thorns on his head and the whole body is bleeding and he's watching the people who put him on the cross, he prayed a prayer that will change anybody. He said, Father, forgive them. I said, you can't pray that. How do you dare pray such a prayer when you're hanging on a cross? So I said, God, I never chose to be Tutsi, so I... I give you all these people. Give me the grace and the strength to forgive them. Then uh, some seven years after that, we went through the genocide, and the Lord told me, keep your heart clean, and I will use you. Through the genocide, I was inside there. You see your people, every day you are getting news. Your cousin has been killed. Your so-and-so has been killed. Your friend so-and-so. And you just wonder, can I stay clean in such a context? My name is Antoine, uh, my personal name, not family name, because in our culture, at least in our generation, children didn't have family names, everybody had his own name, so my personal name is Rutaisire, uh, which means if death doesn't take him, it's a sentence. But I'm not going to go into that again, because that will be another presentation. Uh, and the topic for today is Pursue Unity and Reconciliation, Lessons from Rwanda. I'm sure a good number of people wouldn't know Rwanda if Rwanda hadn't known the 1994 genocide. Because until 1994, many people didn't even know Rwanda existed. I remember in 1995, I went to UK. Uh, not England, because I was in Wales. And when you are in Wales, don't say you are in England, because that would be a crime. So I, <laughs> I was a student in the UK, and uh, I got at the airport in Heathrow, and uh, uh, the gentleman at the immigration asked me, where do you come from, young man? I said, I come from Rwanda. He said, where? I said, Rwanda, where is that? I said, somewhere in Central Africa. He said, in Uganda? I said, no, Rwanda is a different country. <laughs> so we went on, he told me, no, 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 no. I lived in Egypt, and I know all the countries in Africa, and there is no such a country as Rwanda. I said, actually, <laughs> that country has been there since uh, the ninth century. Uh, so, but the thing is, Rwanda wasn't well known until the genocide of 1994. Before that, in 1990, there was this gorilla in the mist, that was another movie that put it on the map, but some people knew the gorillas more than they knew the country. Then today, when you speak of Rwanda, most people say, oh, Hotel Rwanda, because they know the movie, but uh, they don't know the country. So Rwanda is a very small country in the central part of Africa, uh, south of Uganda, north of another small country called Burundi, east of the big Congo, and... Uh, west of Tanzania, which is another country which is well known because it's big, uh, and, and it's near Kenya. So more or less, that's where we are. In 1994, Rwanda uh, went through a man-made tragedy. More than one million people got massacred in 100 days. And uh, when we speak of pursuing reconciliation and unity, it's from that background. 
And uh, to connect with myself, I was born in Rwanda, I grew up in Rwanda, and I'm still living in Rwanda. The only thing I haven't done there is to die there, and that's uh, probably the only thing that's remaining because I've always lived there. And uh, I was born in 1958, and that was the beginning of the troubles in the country because Rwanda was a monarchy with a king from a, a group called the Tutsis. The Tutsis weren't an ethnic group. It was a social class. Everybody who moved up became a Tutsi because you owned cows and cows were the monetary value in our context at that time. And uh, the Tutsis ruled the country for something like 11, 12 centuries. Because the king, you know, a monarchy is not even a group of people. A monarchy is always a transmission of power from father to son. So the king happened to come from the Tutsi group, and they ruled the country for 12 centuries. Then came the colonial periods. Then came the time of independence. Then the king claimed for independence. And then the Belgians, who were our colonizers, turned the population against each other supporting the Hutus, they overthrew the Tutsis, and many people got killed. So that's how the trouble started, because a large number of Tutsis left the country and went living in the neighboring countries of Uganda, Burundi, Congo, and the others. But those who stayed inside the country were mistreated. Actually, this is a simplified, the most simplified presentation of the situation that you can get, because it's more complex than that, but I'm trying to make it simple so that you understand where we come from. And uh, connecting with my personal st story, I happened to come from that ruling group, the Tutsis, and uh, my dad got killed during those first waves of massacres that went on for five years, between 1959 and 1963. And my dad wasn't in politics. He was a businessman. That's why he didn't leave the country. He said, why should I leave the country? I'm not part of the ruling class, so I'm just a businessman. I do business with everybody. So he stayed inside the country. But towards the end of the wave of massacres, he too, he got killed. And I grew up full of anger and hatred against those people who killed my dad. Then it went on because the politics in the country were so bad against the Tutsis. 1973, we were in school, we had another wave of massacres. We were kicked out of school, some of my friends got killed, but we survived. So it went on. Then came 1994, when a million people got killed. And that was the culmination of something like three decades of ethnic tensions and uh, bad relationships. And for me, growing up in that context, I grew up full of anger and hatred. Because when somebody kills your dad, takes away your job, you are really, really, really just messed up. But uh, after my graduation from the university, I became a lecturer at the university. Then one year after, I was redeployed. It's a term they used when they got you out of your job. It wasn't firing you. I was redeployed in the secondary school, lower level, which is what you call high school here. And it's out of that frustration that I started reading the Bible. And I stumbled on Jesus. I really say I wasn't looking for him. I stumbled on him. You know this passage where Paul writes, for me living is Christ and dying will be again. That's in Philippians uh, chapter 1, verse 21. That's the verse that changed my life. I was saying, but this man knows what he lives for. What do I live for? What is the meaning of my life? So from where, from there, I went, on for, I went for a search. I was saying, I need to find out what I live for. So I gave myself six months to read the Bible through three times. Uh, at the university, I was teaching literature. And when you teach literature, you learn to read fast. For those who have done literature, you know some of the books you study are quite huge. You, 
you study English literature, you read a book like Tom Jones, and you have to write a criticism of the book, and then you read some other big books. Reading the Bible in six months, three times was just easy. Two months, one time. Two months, one time, two months, then three times. So I committed my life to the Lord, and I started preaching. But I was a preacher full of anger and hatred. You know, sometimes people don't see that you can preach. You put your anger and your hatred below, you put it under, and then you go on preaching. Then one day when I was reading this passage of Jesus going to the cross, the Lord probably was in business to deal with my anger and my hatred. You know, when you, when you look at Jesus going to the cross, you, you see Jesus coming with a large number of people. Hosanna to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Then all of a sudden they disappear. Then you get him with his 12 disciples. One walks out to betray him. Then he comes back with a mob. When they capture him, nine of his disciples run away. Then uh, Peter follows from a distance. Then John stays close to him. By the time they get in the house of the high priest, my anger was boiling. You know when you've suffered from injustice, you see an injustice and you feel your emotions going to the victim. He said, but these Jews, they are cousins to the Hutus. Because they and that bounced my anger back to me. And God told me, you hate those people. I said, I do. I hate them. Do you know what they did to us? And you see what they are doing to him. And that sparked a journey into change. Because when you see Jesus hanging on the cross, actually what changed my life was the prayer Jesus made when he was on the cross. When he's hanging there, with a crown of thorns on his head, and the whole body is bleeding, and he's watching the people who put him on the cross, he prayed a prayer that will change anybody. He said, Father, forgive them. I said, you can't pray that. How do you dare pray such a prayer when you're hanging on a cross? And he said, Jesus, I can see where you are leading me, but I will not follow you. And that led me to a crisis of faith. I was saying, did he really pray that prayer? But I would go back and the prayer was still there. He did. You know, if you are sitting in here, having been offended or wounded by somebody, very often you notice, you, you, just, you don't want to accept that it's possible to let go. Because it's as if your anger keeps you alive. You just feed on that anger and you just keep it. It's as if it's, it energizes you. And you just wonder if you can live without it. And then um, I just took a day off from the school where I taught. And I said, Jesus, I'm coming and we're going to sort out this issue. I sat and I took my Bible I read from Genesis just all the passages of people who have been wounded. Joseph and his brothers, David and his brothers, and Saul. Uh, come to the New Testament, you get Jesus, you get Stephen, you get Paul and the other. I said, finally, this is a lifestyle. Throughout the Bible, you find that there is a way God tells us to handle our enemies. We forgive them and we love them. Then I said, God, I never chose to be Tutsi. You created me, and you put me in that family, but I chose to be a Christian. So I'm not going to live by my accidentals, because where you were born is just accidental. I happened to be born in Africa, but it was accidental. I studied in the UK, and... Uh, I graduated like British students. I could have been born in the UK. I studied in the US. I did my master's degree at Fuller Theological Seminary. I finished with a GPA of four. 
and he did my doctorate and my dissertation took the award of the year so I could have been American. So where I was born is just accidental. But the choice I made to be a Christian is what will determine everything, even my eternity. So I said, God, I never chose to be Tutsi, so I, I give you all these people. Give me the grace and the strength to forgive them. That was the turning point in my life. And years after, that was 1987, then uh, some seven years after that, we went through the genocide, and the Lord told me, keep your heart clean, and I will use you. Because through the genocide, I was inside there. You see your people, every day you are getting news. Your cousin has been killed. Your so-and-so has been killed. Your friend so-and-so. And you just wonder, can I stay clean in such a context? Yes. And the Lord gives you the courage. You know, sometimes people say, I can't, I don't know if I could. You could. Because when you are thrown into the furnace, the Lord will join you there to give you the courage and the strength to live accordingly. So came the time when the war and the genocide were, were over. We started uh, rebuilding the country, but I had been prepared to give of myself, to contribute. So I'm not going to go into that. Usually I don't like speaking about, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that, because you sound as if you are just trumpeting for yourself. So I will stop here and let you ask questions. I think we have enough to ask questions from. Thank you. And question number one is already covered, and two in, to his presentation. Let's move to question number three. Question number three. Antoine, I want to know what motivated your decision to return to Rwanda, even though you were aware that you, are, you can be killed? Uh, when you were in the UK, yet you had privilege to stay there? Actually, the privilege wasn't there as such because 1985, when you went to study in UK, you signed a contract that you're going to study and then go back to serve your country. And by then, I was a Christian. I was a born-again Christian. As a matter of fact, the temptation even came from my... British friends, they said, but when we hear about your country and the way they are treating you, why should you go back? I said, but I have a contract. They oh, say, no, no, actually, the thing is, if you marry a British girl here, then they are going to cancel the contract. Actually, the possibility was there. I could have married a British girl. Well, I had many friends among the students in the Christian Union where I belonged and the church where I went to. But the thing is, when you've made a commitment, I tend to be very committed to my choices. Because when you sign a contract, I tend to respect the contract as a Christian. Because when you keep changing your positions and your commitments, you become inconsistent. So I simply decided to go back, and mainly because when I was praying, the Lord told me, go back, that's where I want you. As a matter of fact, uh, during the time of the genocide in 1994, I was in a refugee camp, in a displaced people camp inside Rwanda. And uh, by then, I was working with uh, the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, uh, IFS, in charge of the Christian unions in Rwanda. So they saw me on television because one of the people, one of the journalists, happened to go through the camp they were looking for somebody who could speak English and French, and they called upon me. And then uh, in London, in the uh, IFS office, they saw me. So they told a colleague who was in Uganda, and told him, actually, we saw Antoine, he's in a camp in Rwanda. If you can go down there and uh, take some money for him, and then tell him we are ready to pay a ticket for him to come and study, and then when the trouble is over, he can go back to the country. So he came, he found me, and then uh, he went back, told them he had found me, 
And then uh, he told me we, that they got a ticket for you and your wife and your, and your daughter. By then we had one daughter to come to UK and study while waiting for the troubles to be over. So I prayed about it. Then the Lord told me, if you leave at this moment, you will not have a ministry in the country. You stay around, suffer with the people, and then work with them in the reconstruction of the nation. So I wrote back, I told them I'm not coming because the Lord told me to stay. So very often for me, I don't, I don't go where I want. I go where the Lord tells me to go. As a matter of fact, if weren't it for the Lord, I wouldn't be in Rwanda. Because even where I was studying in California, they gave me an offer to stay there and uh, lecture at the university. I told them, well, the Lord told me to go back. So I go where the Lord tells me to go. Simple as that. Wonderful. You just reminded me the story of uh, Dietrich bon Bonhoeffer. Exactly almost the same. The good thing we have another kind of Dietrich Bonhoeffer who is alive. Praise God. Um, by the way, as a reminder, if you need to ask a question, you can write on a piece of paper. Corner will be collecting those questions and, uh, and we'll be able to accommodate them if the time allows us. You've touched a little bit about your situation in Rwanda before genocide. Mm -hmm. And your colleagues, including uh, Israel Havugimana, who is well known, who were very courageous, not, not only even to preach against the discrimination and pursue unity even during that time of the discrimination. Share with us a little bit. I know you talked about courage. The Lord will give you courage. How was that situation to be able to stand during that time? And well, well actually, um, Israel and uh, some of the others were part of... Uh, a group of young preachers who were more of idealists who thought we could change the country uh, using the gospel. So we had a prayer group we always met uh, on Tuesday night to just look at the country and pray about the situation. And uh, Israel was Hutu. So our group was mixed. And uh, he was more vocal because he was older and had, uh, but unfortunately he got killed. As a matter of fact, out of that group, I'm the only one who survived. All the others have been ki were killed because they were targeted because of the kind of voices we raised and uh, noise we made. So, so it's a sad story, but uh, that's how it was. Anyway, so. Because I know a little bit the context. It's very, very touching. Anyway, brother, I've read another book of yours, one of your books, um, Faith Under Fire. Mm -hmm. And on page 112, you mentioned that in 1991, 89.6% of the population identified as Christian, yeah. with 62% of Roman Catholic and the rest Protestant. Then you said Rwanda, I'm, I'm reading, was also known as the crowd of, of the Eastern Africa revival mm -hmm. within Protestant cycles. So my, my question is, with such country, where actually would they expect to be paradise, where 90, almost 90% 90 of people are Christian, then what do you think, what do you believe went wrong? And my second question on that still will be, uh, what, are, what steps should the church have taken differently, and what is the current situation today? Yeah, actually, that's a good question, and I think uh, that's why we can draw lessons for the church all over the world. <clears throat> because uh, we have a big problem with the church, and it's not just in Rwanda. Because um, in South Africa, when apartheid started, the, the church was there and it was very vibrant. 
uh, in Germany, when the Holocaust happened in the countries around, the church was there and it was very vibrant. Earlier than that, when slavery was committed, the church was there and it was very vibrant. Even some of the slave owners were Christians. So there is something wrong with the way we do church. Why? Because very often the church will not touch those social issues that cause problems. And very often when you go into different countries, you see the problem is latent. It's sleeping somewhere. You can perceive it, but the church doesn't touch it. So, in Rwanda, the, the church was part of the problem because when those ethnic politics were put in place, even the church contributed to it. Why? Because as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I will quote this uh, priest. In 1995, the Pope, he too was struggling with that question. He sent an envoy, Cardinal Echegaray. He sent him to Rwanda and Burundi, because Burundi has the same problem, by the way. You are going to see many Burundians around here. Uh, they will tell you they have the same problem. And the envoy of the Pope asked the clergy, said, what went wrong? How can you tell us that in a country where 90% of the people call themselves Christians, a, a million people get killed in 100 days? Then one of the priests said uh, with honesty, said the blood of ethnicity was thicker than the water of baptism. And I think that's true everywhere. Because I keep telling people, everywhere I go, I find racist people who just look at the color of the skin and they draw conclusions. And some of them are Christians. And they forget that we have been created by God. I never decided to be born African. I never decided to be born black. I never decided to be born Rwandese. I just, I was put there by God. But very often, that's something we don't consider. We just go by the biases of our cultures. And the Bible, rather than correct our biases, we adjust our teachings to the social biases. And you find that everywhere. Every country you go, you, and it's not just about those issues, even the modern issues we face. Uh, let me shock you a bit. I'm, maybe I shouldn't. But maybe I should. One time I was... Uh, giving a conference in Australia. And they asked me that question. And I made a blunder. I was holding a newspaper from one of the churches. They said, how could the church tolerate that a genocide be committed? And I picked up the newspaper and I said, actually, the church today here is doing the same. They say, where is the genocide in Australia? Then I read one of the passages, they said, that was 1997, they said, in 1996, 247,000 babies were illegally aborted. And I told them, is this genocide? They said, no. I said, what do you do when you abort a baby? Do we accommodate that in our cultures? Yes. I don't know where Canada stands on that issue, but abortion has been taken as something, if it's, illegal, if it's accepted, then it's done. But the thing is, when do we start being human? I suppose not when I'm born, but when I'm conceived. And I'm sure it's going to shock you when I say this. I remember when I left, uh, one of the gentlemen told me, this is not the best way to raise money. 
I told him, I'm not in Australia to beg. I'm here to preach. So the thing is, sometimes we don't want to hear the, the truth. Because we have accepted things as they are, without looking at what does the Bible say about what we do. Is God on our side? Very often we go by science. Uh, this one I'm not going to go into the depth of it. But the thing is, people will say you science has said this. Science doesn't explain. Science describes. And science doesn't give moral orientation. It gives facts. So science is never in contradiction with the Bible. The Bible tells us where to go according to God. And sometimes we prefer to obey science rather than God. So that's how it works. Thank you so much, brother, for that insight. Very uh, relevant to us today. Uh, if you see Rwanda now, in terms of church still, and we want, let's say, we want to be praying for, for the church in Rwanda, what are the needs? Um, I think lots of things have been achieved. Uh, the church has recovered uh, because we went through a time of um, self-assessment and uh, self-repositioning but we still need to work a lot on really rediscovering that message. Because you see, the problems of society keep moving. Yesterday it was an issue of uh, uh, genocide. Today it's an issue of poverty and an issue of uh, uh, other issues in the society. So we need to pray for the church to be missional. A church that will be able to read the realities of the society and then position itself to respond relevantly. Because we tend to be loved and revered, but quite irrelevant to the society. The society loves us, but at times we are just irrelevant. So that, I always tell people what we need to pray for the church is to really become relevant for the moment. Reconciliation is my lifestyle by Antoine is really an excellent book. And then I will quote from, I was really struck, struck by this. In this book on page 97, you recounted uh, a moment where a genocide survivor, so your, uh, on the side of Tutsi, challenged your efforts as this is after genocide, as you start preaching the gospel, even reaching out to those who committed genocide. So then, which was viewed to the survivors, your, uh, some of your friends as being betrayer. Let me read what you said. This is very important. You wrote, I always remember the day when one genocide survivor came to me and said, what you are doing is betrayal. How dare you preach to those murderers? Let them at least die in sin and go to hell. That is where they will get the right punishment for what they, have, they did to us. What if you preach to them and they repent and go to heaven after all they did to our people? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> this is really very touching. Could you please, uh, uh, my question is, could you please briefly share with us that ex experience and, and help us to see how a wounded individual can choose to forgive and pursue reconciliation. Uh, actually, when you deal with a context of uh, woundedness, you will hear such comments. Uh, and I've heard such comments all over the world. And some of those comments can be as old as the beginning of nations. Uh, let me shock you again here. Uh, because I was uh, one time, actually it was a conference here in Ottawa, I don't remember the year. And uh, I happened to give my presentation about forgiveness because it was a conference of people who have gone through genocides and mass killings. And I listened to the people talking 
Some of them went as far as the 15th century, 16th century, like the First Nations here, like the Indians in America, like the Aboriginals in Australia, like the Maoris in uh, New Zealand. And actually, it was a conglomeration of people who had been hurt. And was saying, but these people, they've been keeping this anger for so many years. Then finally, I spoke about Rwanda. And I told them, I'm not just going to tell you about what we went through in Rwanda. I'm simply going to tell you how you heal from anger and from woundedness. Because when you keep a wounded spirit, you become like a broken spring. When you push it down, it stays there. You need to heal. Then that's when one Mohawk chief, actually I still have his regalia, he gave them to me, he gave me his uh, beads, and uh, he told me, actually, today you help me to understand some of the issues in our reservations. Some of our young people, we are getting so much money from the government, but they are not bouncing back into the community. Because until you understand this issue of healing and forgiveness, you will never understand why some communities don't get restored because they keep feeding themselves on the wounds of the past. They keep accusing, they say, they did this to us, they did this to us, but that happened long ago. Unless you help the people heal from the spirit of victimhood, they never recover. And that's something we are trying to, that's what we found, because those people were saying, why are you preaching to those people? I told them, we are going to live together. We have a small country. We are going to live next to each other. So we need forgiveness and repentance, and we need reconciliation. And reconciliation is not keeping telling people you did wrong. It's just accepting that the wrong has been committed. Then you put an end to it, and you start a new page. And very often, the mistake people make, even nations, they simply keep the wounds and they become a manipulative pool where people say, you did this to us, so you must do this to us, for us. When you keep that spirit of victimhood, people don't heal. And that's something people need to understand because it stays there. I've been to Australia, I hear the same voice from the Aboriginals. I went to New Zealand, I hear the same voice from the Maoris. I hear the same here and everywhere. So the thing is, as nations, we need to learn lessons of when God tells us to forgive, he's helping us to heal from the wounds. What has happened in the past? I shouldn't, keep, I shouldn't be a slave of my past. I accept it had happened. I process it. I heal from it. Then I pick up my pieces and I move on. Otherwise, you stay in the place where you got wounded. That's why you see many people. They are still talking about issues that happened centuries ago. Why? They got stuck in that spot. Why? Because they didn't forgive and get healed. And that's something we need to understand as a church. Because the church, we are the ones who have been entrusted with the message of reconciliation. The government can do what they do. But the church, we have the message and we have the ministry. And unfortunately, all over the world, wherever I go, we haven't done our job properly. So let me ask this question again, very relevant to us in Canada. Um, now, uh, the racial issues has been, especially in these three years, the tension has really grown up. So racial issues. I, I, I remember, just to give you a story, I remember one time I was serving here, and uh, she's, she's part of our church. She came and she gave me something to give another guy. So the guy was, uh, was black. And he said, uh, Pastor Manasseh, would you help me to give this to pass it to one of the usher tall? He tried to give me a description. Then I say, oh, so and so, yes. So and then I passed, I gave it to the person, but the person, it was a, a different person. 
And when I come back and ask, um, I gave it to the person. He, she said, who? I said, the person. No, I, met, I, I meant the guy who has, like you. <laughs> so, in, in fact, she meant another guy who had a skin like mine. And I was like, you should have said the guy who is black. That's fine. Uh, so it's really an issue if, let's say, today some a colleague says to me, uh, uh, even kindly, and say, you are black, it becomes like discrimination. It becomes a big issue. You've went through those things. Are those really a big issue? How to heal in the, how to overcome those challenges? That's a very interesting thing because here, uh, Canada has so many groups. And in most of those groups, they came with their wounds. As a matter of fact, I expect that you're going to have more trouble in the coming days because you get Tutsis from Burundi, and the Hutus from Rwanda, and the Tutsis from Rwanda, and people from the Congo. And all those people, they just bring their problems and drop them here. So you end up with all the, and then you have your own problems with the, with the French, uh, the Quebecois, and uh, the, the British, and whatever. So it's, you know, when you get all those people, actually that's why I find that the church has a golden opportunity at this moment because most of the people who are coming, they are coming with their wounds. Nobody has bandaged those wounds. Nobody has healed those wounds. You just accommodate them, but they are coming with their wounds. Take the case of the Rwanda. Uh, one time I was giving a talk in Montreal, Montreal. And uh, <laughs> I had those Rwandese mixed with Congolese and Burundians. They stood up and they just made a lot of noise. I said, brothers and sisters, you are in Canada. Why do you bring those issues from Rwanda and Burundi and you just transfer them into Canada? So sure enough, when I come, I come with my problems. But somebody has to help me to offload those issues and leave them behind. And who is going to do that? Not the government. The government will provide asylum, they will provide money, they will provide uh, shelter, but the church will provide the healing and the transformation. So we need to do our job right. We have the message and the ministry. Connor, would you mind, before we wrap up, would you mind to share with us just a few questions from the audience as well? Um, many of the Old Testament prophets were persecuted by the people of Israel. Do you identify with any particular prophet, and what would you admire about their perseverance? <laughs> uh, if I were to identify with one prophet, it would be Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah kept crying for his people and warning them, but they refused to listen until it happened. And he wrote the book of Lamentations. Uh, and very often I said, well, I too I need to write a Lamentation book because we told the people they are going the wrong direction. They kept going and we ended up in a mess. So I identify with Jeremiah. Actually, he was the most beaten uh, of all the prophets. And he prophesied over a long period, but things happened. Um, in what way did you know that God told you to stay in Rwanda? In what way? God speaks. So I'm not going to go into a theology of how God speaks, but... Uh, when you, uh, when, you, when you know God and you pray, then God speaks. At least the God I believe in still speaks. He speaks to me in many ways, through the Bible, through my heart, through other people, through circumstances, so God speaks. <clears throat> Canada has no law to protect the unborn at any stage. Should the church be leading the way to push to have laws to protect life? I don't think the church would manage to do it, but uh, if they did, that would be good. Because very often the church tends to accommodate what comes from on high. So, but if they did, believe me or not, I think personally as a pastor and uh, as a person, abortion is a crime. In some cases, yes, it, it may, be, may not be a crime, but 
aborting a baby because you don't like the baby, it's like killing somebody because you don't like him. It's simply that the baby is not able to speak. But if you have watched some of the movies where they are trying to get those babies out, it's as if they are really crying for help. Is there still, okay. is there still head between Tutsi and Hutu? Oh, check in Canada. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, uh, those issues don't disappear in one day. It's just, you don't just do like this, you wave your hand and they are gone. It's, uh, it will take at least uh, three generations because our generation has been wounded uh, and others are living in the shame of what their people did. So I can't tell you that it's going to be over in one decade. Then our next generation, our children, are being contaminated by the, our presence. So they are, they are inheriting some of the wounds. Maybe our grandchildren, who are going to grow in a healthier environment, seeing their dads and moms and their grandfathers, may have some small remnant of uh, hatred, but... It's not something that disappears in just one wave of the hand and it's done, no. It's still there. More so in countries <laughs> like Canada where you have many Tutsis and Hutus just uh, exchanging bitter words and things like those. Anyway. Were you ever called upon uh, to South Africa to go and help with reconciliation after the end of the apartheid in 1994? Uh, actually, you know, the apartheid in South Africa ended when Rwanda was thrown into the furnace of the genocide. It was the same month, actually, the month South Africa went for elections when uh, de Klerk handed over to Mandela was the same month that uh, genocide happened in Rwanda. It was April 1994. And uh, rather than learn from us, we learned from them. Although not everything, because South Africa put in place the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So our Unity and Reconciliation Commission started five years after, in 1999. We went to South Africa to see what they had done, to learn from them. So we went to other countries where they had gone through similar stories, like Germany and uh, uh, Northern Ireland and other places. So we, we, we shopped for solutions, then we put them together and concocted our own uh, national policy for reconciliation, which is totally different from the South African. So we never went, but I've, I've, I've been to South Africa on a few occasions and spoken in a few conferences, but uh, they still need reconciliation. Actually, as a matter of fact, as I said about Rwanda, it's the same with South Africa, because South Africa, you see, Peaceful possession of power doesn't mean reconciliation. And I think that's where South Africa made a mistake. They, they transmitted the power from the whites to the blacks, but they, they never went back to reconcile the communities. I remember one time I was talking to a group of uh, white farmers in uh, Peter Marsburg in uh, KwaZulu-Natal. They said, what can we do? These people tend to keep on hating us, although they, they have the power. I said, sure, they have the power, but they are not healed. The wounds of the past are still there, and they are still living in the townships where they were. And you are still enjoying the wealth. And what you can do, you just help them to grow in wealth, because you know how to do things, you know how to cultivate land and exploit it and sell, but they don't know. So they are jealous. But if you help them and you empower them, then maybe something is going to happen. Because it's, it's not an easy thing. Reconciliation has, calls for deep thought and uh, coming together and uh, learning, uh, analyzing the issues. But South Africa, to be honest with you, uh, I hope nobody is going to be angry. I don't take South Africa as a model of reconciliation. It's a model of possession of power from one group to another. But in terms of reconciliation, they stopped too early. They did their diagnosis with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, 
but they didn't go as far as correcting some of the things, mainly the healing in the hearts of the people, changing things without offending each other. Because you see, the problem with the, like Zimbabwe, the problem is that sometimes people think that if you take the, the, the power from the whites, I mean the economic power, you take the banks, you take the businesses, then you are doing reconciliation. No, you are doing revenge. And sometimes people confuse revenge and reconciliation. It's not the same thing. And what I've seen in South Africa with the affirmative kind of approaches, they are simply preventing the whites to access education and other things, which is not right. Somebody who went to South Africa in the 15th century, 16th century, he's South African. He may be white, but he's South African. It's not because we have a difference of color that makes that you don't belong, because you tell somebody, go back, back to where? I don't even know where my ancestors came from. I was born here. That's my place. So, and I think there is a, a change of mindset that needs to be accomplished in many places, but very often we don't go as far as needed to correct things. We, we simply, politicians tend to be kind of um, opportunistic, what term can I use? It's uh, to be satisfied with the appearances. But the thing is, you need to go deeper. It, that's why they, they pretend a lot. They, they even lie. And so they tell you things are right, but they know they're hiding things. They're, they're even doing things. And <laughs> so anyway, but again, I, I go back to the church. It's the church that has the mission. Because all those people, black and white, in South Africa, they go to church, majority. So if we help them to heal and then come together and solve the issues, we build better nations. And it's true even here. Everywhere you go, you find the same issues. Wonderful. As we wrap up, um, let me ask you a few questions. One is uh, about consequences of not forgiving and reconciliation. What if, what if I don't forgive? Well, um, consequences of not forgiving, even not repenting. If you don't forgive, you are condemning yourself to victimhood. You, you, keep, you, you keep going back to that issue again and again and again and again and again. So you become a victim forever. Forgiving liberates us. You are freed from the entanglements of the past. And when you don't forgive, it's like planting a mine on the path of the future. Because when you don't forgive, you hand over your anger and your wounds to the next generation. And they carry them. That's why in most nations, like uh, take your first nations, Take the, the Indians in America down here, or the Hutus and Tutsis in Rwanda and other places. You, most of the things that killed our nations, they, have, they go back into the far past. By the way, even, even, even when you go to Europe, this issue of the Serbs and Croats, do you know the issue that sparked off that thing goes back to the 13th century? So things like those. So when you don't forgive, you are planting a landmine on the path of the future because people will fall on it and sometimes they don't know where it comes from. Um, okay, we are closer to the end. How can we be praying for you, Antoine? I know you have a busy schedule. Um, yeah, how can we be praying for you? Just pray. <laughs> Uh, presently, I'm, I'm enjoying my retirement, so you pray for health, because the only thing I don't like when you get older, you, you start losing your health, but uh, that's normal, because you are getting old. So, otherwise, uh, you pray that uh, I stay tuned to the Lord, and listen to His voice, and do, and fulfill my mission. I don't run any ministry at this moment, so I'm not uh, 
You are yeah. not starting a church? Or? Uh, well, no, 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 no. That's not retirement. Yeah. You, you, you don't start another job when you are retired because that's not retirement. It's a change of uh, profession. So I'm not changing professions. I'm retired. Uh, good. <laughs> but still involved in the work of the kingdom. Um, as you prepare, my final point will be any final thought you can share with us. But let me read this quote. I think it's really important to read it together. It's on page um, 111 of this book. It's related to what you talked about, the cross. Yeah, very, very great insight. Um, it's related to the message we have as a church. We have the message and we have the ministry. I love that. You said it is at the foot of the cross that we find level ground where the offender and the offended find common ground for reconciliation. Reconciliation is the heart of the gospel and it is the only hope for humanity. It is only those who have been forgiven who can forgive. It is only those who know the grace of God who can confess their sins without fear and con of condemnation. And it, it is such people who become ambassadors of reconciliation. When you have tested the sweetness of, of a recon reconciled life, you cannot keep it to yourself. You cannot stop telling others about it. I love that. Well, anyway, uh, any final thought? I love that too. <laughs> because I wrote it. So <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think that's really the conclusion of everything because when I, when I wrote that book on uh, reconciliation and I finally said, well, reconciliation is my lifestyle, I, I found that all of us, even those sitting here, we need reconciliation because reconciliation has been reduced to ethnic issues, but it's not. I need reconciliation with myself. Some of you may be sitting here carrying a burden of guilt for something you did long ago, and you live with a regret, and you need to forgive yourself. Some may be living with uh, hurts from somebody who betrayed you, abandoned you, cheated from you, things like those. And you sit there and say, actually, maybe if I gave away this, that would be helpful. Because sometimes all of us, we need to understand that we need to live this life of reconciliation. You keep on forgiving. Even when you are driving on the street, you don't drive as bad as we do in, in our part of the world. I often joke with that and tell people, if you drive on the streets of Kigali, you need a dose of reconciliation and forgiveness because somebody will cut you away from a corner and you just say, you feel like insulting them and say, may the Lord bless you. So you, but uh, we live in societies that tend to compete uh, and uh, everybody's pushing and hustling and, uh, and then you just, when you look at the hustlers around you, you just bless them. So you live a reconciled life because it gives you peace and you give peace to others. So that's all. But before we end, um, brother, thank you so much thank for you. coming and ministering to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.